Welcome to Ministry in Motion, where we explore best practices for your ministry in the 21st century. Our topic today, building a support network. Our guest is Dr. Bill Knott. Bill, thanks for being with us today. Good to be here. Now, many people know you've got a team. You're the editor and executive publisher of Adventist Review and Adventist World. And so you've got regular deadlines. And Every you've week. Got, you've got all kinds of things that are happening. But we're talking here, at least to start with, about you as a leader. Uh, we've got pastors, lay leaders who watch. And some of them may have this kind of Lone Ranger syndrome idea about ministry. Some may even have been taught, don't get too close to the people in your congregation. You know, you've got to keep this professional distance. Let, let's start. How, how important is a support network for a pastor or lay leader in a congregation? You referred to something that I think was part of the training many of us got either formally or informally, which said, be cautious about building a support network. You don't want to reveal too much of yourself. Don't wear your heart on your sleeve. All of the old adages that came from being a, in a cautious culture have flowed more especially into various leadership in ministry roles. And so many of us came to these leadership roles quite unprepared mm -hmm to build the very kind of communities for ourselves that we said our congregation should become. And my premise is that a healthy leader participates in exactly the structures that he's trying to build or she's trying to build. Mm. That in fact, if you aren't in a healthy set of, of networked relationships, your likelihood of being able to encourage others to build and join those is greatly diminished. Mm. Thus the priority of the pastor a male or female or, or local leader, elder, investing in building, intentionally building a network that helps them express their giftedness and achieve what God has for them. You know, I was speaking to someone one time about sermon planning yeah, yeah. and uh, getting others involved in the congregation. That's a network type. Oh, yeah. and, and the person responded and said, you know, that's just something that God reveals to me. Uh -huh. And I thought, some people do ministry like that. Yeah. Oh, yes. Like, you're not saying don't depend upon God, right? Not even remotely. I'm saying that God works in a variety of ways, mm. clearly and perhaps primarily in the mind of the individual who is being led to ministry or to, to serve, but also through those who are served by that ministry. Their input, their involvement, their responses, their reactions are part of God's message to the leader. Mm. And listening well to those, bringing them around you in a conscious, intentional community that can talk candidly with you. As a pastor, I formed a sermon advisory group right. that was designed to talk to me at least every quarter for a lengthy session. What was the last quarter's preaching like? What were the things that worked? What didn't? That was another form of the kind of community I'm describing. Now, you made this statement. You said healthy pastors need to be involved in caring, supportive relationships in order to fulfill their calling. So this is not uh, a nice optional extra. I, I think the thing that moves a pastor from competency to fulfilling God's plan for him or her is exactly this component, intentionally building around oneself, whether that's in the same geographical region or perhaps it's virtual community on the phone or via the web, but building around oneself a community where we can be Christians and believers first and not primarily living in side the role of pastor or elder or ministry leader that is frequently inhibiting to our own spiritual growth if, we, if we're truthful about it. Mm. Now you've talked about the fact that, uh, I have a note here, no one else will build the support network that you need. Yeah. Um, how, you're saying that, that the leader needs to take the initiative. I, I'm, I remember as a young pastor hearing a fascinating uh, conversation. Charles Swindoll in his daily radio program at the mm -hmm. time was talking about how he had gone out as a younger pastor and consciously built around him an accountability and support group believing that this group would help him achieve what God had in mind for him. He, he talked about their practices as a group, that the, the ways they prayed for each other and talked with each other and what he had gained from that as a pastor. And then he said something fascinating. He said, today, 
Those individuals are my staff. He had deliberately brought them even closer into his professional world mm. so that they could bring that same critique and candor and love and affection close into him. I would say, watching that man's career, he was at the peak of his career when he most successfully brought that group around him. Mm. He did his best work at a time when he had intentionally gone out and built a community that would let him express his gifts in, his, in God's particular way. Now, you're not just talking theoretically because no. this is something that you've seen a need for. So what did you do? You've yeah. been a pastor and now you're an editor. Uh, let's go back to pastoral context. Yeah, sure. Uh, did you see that need and did you intentionally act upon it? Um, in my last pastoral position, um, which was a few years ago now, I have to admit, I was invited into just such a group by a group, an interfaith group of pastors. And we met with a solemn covenant every Thursday afternoon at three o'clock. Mm. That was part of the covenant. You were going to be there every week and you were going to also take a 24 hour retreat once a quarter mm. with this group of individuals and, and spend time praying and talking with each other. That group, which I joined, at their invitation, I would not miss after a few weeks because of the richness they poured into my life, the support I found there. In some cases, I heard God speaking to them, through them, pastors of other faiths, into my life things that I would not have gained at all on my own and might not have even gained in my own faith community. God used them to shape and inform my ministry. You know, I'm thinking my last pastoral assignment, yeah. Orlando, Florida, Forest Lake Church, yeah. for Four of us yeah. formed a covenant. Yeah. We met Sunday, 7 p.m. Yeah. every week. Yes. Yeah. And, and the support there, oh, yeah. I, I would have left my assignment quicker than I would have left that group. Absolutely. I felt such a Absolutely. bonding and a support. I look back and that was a critical uh, uh, moment for me, making that decision. After the break, we want to talk about how you go about looking for that support. Maybe you're watching today, lay leader in your church, pastor, and you're saying, I have a group like that, and I know exactly what Dr. Bill Knott's talking about. Some of you might be saying, I need a group like that. So where do we go to look for the right kind of individuals to build a support network? We'll talk about that right after the break. <music> Welcome back to Ministry in Motion. Our topic today, building a support network. How valuable that can be for you, whether you're a lay leader in the church or a pastor, having that support network can be such a blessing. Our guest, Dr. Bill Knott. Bill, we, we've talked about not only the need, but actually the responsibility yeah. that a leader has, whether he or she is a full-time pastor or a volunteer worker, to have that support network. How do I go about choosing people? I'm assuming it doesn't have to be a huge number. No. But how do I go about selecting viable candidates? And I presume then I ask them if they'd be willing to be part of that support network. I think the process, like most good processes, begins with prayer. And really seeking God's will over a period of time and saying, Lord, reveal to me those individuals who you have already appointed Mm. in my community or in my virtual community who you intend to bless my ministry and to help shape me into the man or the woman you're calling me to be in ministry. That, it, that prayerfulness is, the, is, in my view, the, the key ingredient. Often we rush over that and we say, who are my friends or who lives nearby or uh, who, can I, who do I feel comfortable talking with or who do I play golf with? Those qualifiers may not be the ones that bring people, the right people to your circle of support and the one you need to form. So spending time in prayer to identify those whom the Spirit says to you, this is the right individual to bring in close. Mm. They've got something that I'm working on in their life that's mm -hmm. right for your life. It's important here to turn to people who are probably not in your professional chain of command or line of authority. Frequently, those, when we talk about individuals who are somehow in our employment ladder, mm -hmm. it's difficult for us to be the open and honest and transparent persons that we need to be in these support environments to grow. 
we, if when we start worrying that we're going to be quoted, or we start, we start worrying that some anecdote we told will find its way to some committee meeting at some point, we, we grow inhibited in our growth processes and in our understanding of what God's trying to do in this environment. Mm. And so it's usually wise not to search within one's own sort of chain of command, if you can call it that, whatever, whether that's in a local congregation, working in a denominational structure, useful to turn to professionals who are either at a distance or sometimes persons in other faith groups who share a similar bond and a desire to grow together as believers. Mm. I'm thinking in my own experience at yeah. Forest Lake Church, yeah. where as I came there, there were some very clear indicators that I needed to build a support network. Yeah. And uh, I, I began to pray, and yeah. it was interesting. I, I spoke to three other people. Yeah. They were all executives yeah. uh, in the health system. And, and several of them had said, we've been thinking about doing something like, in fact, they said, we would have chosen the people that you chose. Yeah. So there's this sense of um, providential leading, but, but you're saying make sure it's someone that understands the same kind of what, life challenges that you face? Again, no, no disparaging of the different professions to which God calls us, but there are some people who will understand a ministry leadership role much better than others will right. by their life experience or their sensitivities or the gifts God's given them. Those are the people you want to bring in who naturally have some grasp of the tensions, the, sometimes the anxieties, the stresses that are on the life of a ministry leader. Bringing them in close after a time of prayerful deliberation is frequently a wiser and safer course than simply simply relating to those who are nearest geographically or one with whom one played golf in seminary. Um, that group of individuals may not be the ones who are best suited to help you grow. It, God has a group there. I, I have genuinely come to believe that around every leader, God has already anointed and appointed a group of individuals mm. whom he intends to be there to grow that leader into all that God wants. I don't know their names, and part of the joy of ministry is discovering them as we grow in a, in a service community. You know, the startling thought just came to me with Jesus and the Twelve, yeah. uh, and, and even smaller, Jesus and uh, Peter, James, and John, yeah. that, that it was not only for their benefit that he gathered that circle. I think in Gethsemane where he asked them to pray yes, with him. Absolutely. I, when, when you, that particular story happens to be a favorite because it illustrates to me Jesus wanted around him the support of persons who would pray with him and encourage him in his darkest hour. Right. And it was their failure to be there as human beings, not primarily as disciples, that was the, the, was the failure of that evening and mm. of that moment. Mm. That Jesus in his humanity needed exactly the thing that every other ministry leader does mm. need right there. And he had built around him a circle of those he called to himself. Scripture yes, says right. he deliberately Part went out three. and chose individuals right. who to would be walk, with him. to be with him, that was, to walk yeah. with him, to journey with him, to spend time with him. Mm. It wasn't only for their training; it was for his support. I see that with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus absolutely, too. Absolutely, absolutely. They were part of that wider support that group. That home in in Bethany. I have often said in, in preaching that Jesus had more than twelve disciples when he visited Bethany. <laughs> that Mary and Martha and Lazarus were just as truly disciples, though they had never rowed a fishing boat across the Galilee or watched the pigs go careening into the lake. Right. They were disciples, though they didn't cross salt water or go on missionary journeys. Right. And the thing that defined them as disciples was that they were part of that network that, that allowed Jesus to be all that God had called him to be. Now, you, we've got, okay, these people have similar, maybe they're in a similar type of leadership position, not part of the, the chain of command. Yeah, right. But there are some things that might disqualify a person yeah. from being in your uh, support network. You say, now be careful, make sure what are some things that are important or would be red flags if you saw them missing. This is where a piece of that advice many of us got back in seminary or back in our younger years has some validity. Avoid opening your heart to those you serve as a professional about issues that should stay and perhaps appropriately are more personal or of a personal nature. This isn't to say don't reveal anything about your personal life. Uh, I've made that mistake in, in ministry where I, I was kind of an unknown figure to my congregation mm -hmm. at times. 
but it is to say that if you expect this support network, this group, to move into territory that could be vulnerable or in some cases confidential, not every member of your congregation, in fact relatively few of them, are prepared professionally or understanding of confidentiality to be part of such a group. Mm. So this is why you draw to yourself in a group those who understand that professional task, understand the professional ethics that are involved in that kind of an environment. So we, we see that it's important. Yeah. Jesus modeled that. Yeah, exactly. uh, we're going to look for people that we see have these qualities that perhaps are needed even in our own ministry, but also intellectually and emotionally stable. After the break, we want to talk about how do we go about actually building that network and sustaining it? Because we're looking at long-term blessings as we build a support network. We'll be right back after the break. Welcome back to Ministry in Motion. Our topic today, building a support network. Our guest, Dr. Bill Knott. Bill, I'm convinced this is important. Yeah. We've talked about the kind of individuals. They need to be emotionally stable, confidential. And then it takes time to actually build that, that solid support network. How do I go about that? Most groups that end up being sustainable and successful define for themselves, and this is mutually defined, not defined by any one member of the group, um, what their boundaries are, what, what, what's in and what's out with this group, what is going to be part of our practice and what isn't. Negotiating that and learning how to negotiate that with this group you gather around yourself as a ministry leader is an important early step in getting that group formed. If this is going to be a place where we're going to talk transparently about struggles and challenges in our lives, then we have to build understandings of boundaries of confidentiality. Sure. What is said in this room will not move outside of this room. What the stories you hear here can't be shared with a, a spouse or a friend or another member of the congregation. And not by declaring those things, but by negotiating them so that we, we arrive together at a, as a group at an understanding of what our values are. And we remind each other, we revisit those boundaries periodically. We say, how are we doing on keeping our, our, our pledges to each other? Uh, you ever feel tempted to tell a story you, you heard in this room? Mm. You ever, it, and, and asking people about the tensions they experience, because frequently someone will say, well, what's that group you go to on Thursday morning? What do you guys talk about anyway? <laughs> we have to be very, very mm -hmm. careful and thoughtful in how we treat that open-hearted time we spend with others in our support network. And I'm guessing like a, one of the most simple boundaries would be we're going to meet once a week on yes. Thursday at nine o'clock right. or something right. rather than, well, we'll get together once in a while. And the once in a while is never end work. up. <laughs> they, they, they get value from the opportunity, no mm. doubt, mm. but they miss the rhythmic growth right. that God has in mind for the ministry leader who is regularly in contact with God appointed people mm. surrounding them. That rhythmic growth, I think, is the key to real sustainable change and transformation in our personal lives, in our professional lives. Uh, let's talk about assessment, too, yeah, yeah. because uh, uh, you were part of a group. You yes. said that met for several years, yes. right? Three years in uh, one case and nine in another, yes. In the group I was part of in Orlando, uh, once a year, we were four men, yeah. once a year we would invite our spouses. Yes. And part of our accountability was, was not related to job performance, right. but am I being a faithful husband? Yes. Am I being a, a faithful father? Yes. These were important issues for us with all of the demands of work. It was quite a, a, an experience to bring the four spouses in oh, yes. and say, is this making any difference? I remember when I was part of an interfaith pastors group, this one that met every Thursday afternoon and once a quarter for a 24-hour retreat up at a cabin in the hills. Someone asking the question, Bill, if Debbie sat right there and we were to ask these questions of her, how would she answer them? <laughs> That's assessment. It because is. you now have to think, 
would my spouse say that this time I'm investing in this group is actually causing me to grow as a person, as a husband, as a father? Mm -hmm. Am I, in fact, becoming that more spiritual person that God is calling me to be? Mm -hmm. Or is this sort of a gadfly time in which I'm socializing right. with some friends? Right. There is a distinct difference between a social group, which happens because people love to play golf together or racquetball or go walking or hiking or whatever, and the kind of group we're describing here, which is an intentionally focused mm -hmm. group of gathering those whom God has shown us are part of his plan for our growth. I, I wrote down a comment. You were talking about keeping the group moving and growing. You said, become the supportive, caring friend you're seeking to find for yourself. Yeah. That sounds like the golden rule, doesn't it? Treat others in the group. Just the another way, way of restating that, but applied to this context, and it, it means this for me. Just as God has appointed persons, Derek, to be around you, to support you, so you can be the best ministry leader you can be, and I believe he's done that, he has also appointed you to be part of someone's support group. Mm. It may be individuals in that circle. It may be other individuals in other environments, some of them at long distance even. Mm. Today, with the way technology works for us all, the community that supports us may not geographically gather in the same room. That's the startling development for some of us. We thought, well, I don't know five or six people anywhere nearby. The reality is I have personally experienced in the last five years an amazing level of professional and personal spiritual support coming from persons who never meet in the same room and who some of whom don't even fully know each other but are aware that they are in some way part of that circle that is helping me become the man God's calling me to be. So I could use Skype? Absolutely. Video conference? Uh, FaceTime, any number of technologies out there that help that group if you want them to gather and or in some cases, it's just periodic, regular contact with prayerful people. You will hear, if they're actually the people God has intended for you, you will hear similar things coming from them, even if you poll them all separately, because one in the same spirit mm. is directing the traffic. Mm. Now, I'm going to hold you some accountability here. Yes. You had this great group when you were pastoring. Yeah. Then you moved to Washington. Yes. What did you do? Did you have to start again, like you talked about, take responsibility, build a new team, build a support network? Absolutely. In fact, did that within six months. I met an, a friend in a church I joined. I was no longer the ministry leader. I was in the ministry team as a volunteer. My professional job was here as an editor. We started meeting and started inviting people into that circle, and soon we had four and then five individuals. The core of that group stayed together for about six years. Among other things, many, many life experiences happened to that group. One member died, grew terminally ill with cancer and died, and we, we met and struggled together and prayed through that experience. Mm. Uh, an, another member eventually took a call to another ministry location and moved away. The last two of us stayed there for two years in contact with each other, believing that God had called us to build each other up. And we stay in contact today, even though now we live on opposite coasts. We do this same mm -hmm. thing for each other via the phone, via Skype, and an annual meeting where we get together. Now, someone might be listening to you and saying, you're editor and executive publisher of Adventist Review and Adventist World. You're such a gifted leader, you don't even need a support group. The exact opposite is true. As God places more ministry responsibility on you, you need and must cultivate a support group to, to exercise the gifts God has given you. And it might be that the reason, by God's grace, that you're such an effective leader and healthy for the long haul is because that support group is with you, praying for you? I'll tell you, there are many, many days when I make far better decisions because I know that there's a circle of individuals out there today praying for me, texting me periodically, sending me a Bible text saying, be encouraged today, God's at work in your life. I walk back, when I walk back to my office this afternoon, there are likely going to be at least two texts from some of those individuals who are part of that virtual group I've described. Building a support network, you've convinced me. Yeah. Actually, I was already convinced. Dr. Bill Knott, thanks for joining us on Ministry in Motion. And thank you for being here with us. You're convinced too, I can sense it, of the importance of having a healthy network of support 
It's not only to bless your life, but will increase the impact of your ministry and bless the lives of those around you. Thanks for joining us for Ministry in Motion. May God bless you as you minister to others in Jesus' name.